Welcome to E3 Rehab. I'm Dr. Mark Sertica, physical therapist. Today, we're gonna to discuss scapular dyskinesis. What is scapular dyskinesis? Is it the cause or effect of pain? Does it increase your injury risk? What does traditional rehab generally look like? And what are some of my practical recommendations regarding the topic? Before I talk about scapular dyskinesis, I think it's important to discuss the relevant anatomy as it relates to the shoulder and how that ties into this concept known as the scapulohumeral rhythm. When most people consider the shoulder, they're thinking about this ball and socket glenohumeral joint, which is the articulation between the head of the humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula. However, we also have to consider the sternoclavicular joint, which is the connection between the medial aspect of the collarbone and the sternum here, as well as the acromioclavicular joint, which is kind of the lateral projection of this collarbone or clavicle and the acromion of the scapula. Combined, those two joints actually help create the movement at the scapulothoracic joint, which isn't a true joint, but it's this relationship between the scapula here and the thorax. So the scapulohumeral rhythm coined by Dr. Codman in the 1930s refers to these four joints working together to create movement. It was widely popularized by Inman and colleagues in 1944. What they did is they used imaging and bone pins in a single subject to determine that the normal scapulohumeral rhythm occurred in a two to one ratio. To somewhat simplify it for the purpose of this video, I'll have Nicole raise her right arm into 180 degrees of abduction. So according to this two to one ratio, I would expect two degrees of glenohumeral abduction for every one degree of upward rotation. Therefore, for her to get her arm into 180 degrees of abduction or reaching all the way overhead, I would expect 120 degrees of that to come from the glenohumeral joint and 60 degrees of that to come from the scapula here. Now this has been tested and retested quite a bit since that time. And we see that there's a lot of variability in the movement, meaning that if Nicole raises her arm into abduction, scaption, or flexion, that rhythm will change for each one of those planes of movement. We also see that that rhythm doesn't necessarily maintain itself throughout the entire arc of motion. So it might be different at 60 degrees versus 90 degrees versus 120 degrees versus 150 degrees. Other factors include age, gender, pain, fatigue, resistance, athlete versus non-athlete, type of athlete, dominant versus non-dominant hand. We don't always see predictable changes either, meaning that pain might increase, decrease, or cause no change in the scapular motion. Scapular dyskinesis, what is it? Basically, it's abnormal scapular motion. But it's really hard to define abnormal because as I just highlighted, we have a difficult time defining normal. There are three primary scapular dyskinesis classification systems. The first started with Kibler et al. in 2002, and they categorized scapular motion into four types. The first type, type one, would be inferior angle. So it's if we see a prominence of that inferior angle during this overhead motion. Type two would be this medial border, and so this medial border would be prominent during that overhead motion. Type three was superior, meaning that we'd see a shrug of that shoulder. And then type four, they just identify as normal scapular motion. Yule et al. in 2009 simplified this into a yes, no method. Yes, you have one of those types, type one through three, or no, you don't have any aberrant motion. Simultaneously, McClure et al. and Tate et al. in 2009 were creating their own scapular dyskinesis test in which they had participants raise their arms into shoulder flexion and abduction for five repetitions using a weight 
going up to the count of three and coming down to the count of three. They were looking for what they called dysrhythmia or winging. And then they would call it either subtle, obvious, or normal. So now that I've defined scapular dyskinesis and what we're looking for, we have to determine if it's actually a problem. I like to think of the chicken or egg scenario. Is it the cause of pain or the effect of pain? Is it both? Is it neither? Well, that same study by Tate et al. in 2009 looked at the relationship between pain and scapular dyskinesis in overhead athletes and concluded the presence of shoulder symptoms was not different between the normal and obvious dyskinesis volunteers. And there was no relationship between the presence of pain and scapular dyskinesis in these athletes. One of my favorite studies on the topic is by Plummer et al. in 2017. They concluded that the occurrence of scapular dyskinesis is not influenced by the presence of shoulder pain and may represent normal movement variability. Here's the kicker in this study though. They found that if you're unblinded, meaning that you know someone has shoulder pain prior to observing their scapular motion, you're more likely to classify them as having scapular dyskinesis. So if you're trained to find faults, you're more likely to find them even if they don't exist. A different way of thinking about scapular dyskinesis is that it might actually be a beneficial adaptation. It's prevalent in up to 61% of overhead athletes compared to 33% in non-overhead athletes and different overhead athletes demonstrate different scapular kinematics. It's possible that it's part of what makes them good at what they do, kind of like the changes that we see in the shoulder of a baseball pitcher. Let's assume that scapular dyskinesis is abnormal. Can it predict or put you at future risk of injury? There are seven prospective studies which essentially assess scapular dyskinesis in athletes preseason and then follow them up over the course of one to two seasons to see if they develop pain or injury. Three studies looking at competitive baseball players and recreational overhead athletes found that scapular dyskinesis was not associated with future injury. One study in elite handball players did find an association in 2014, but when they replicated the study in 2018, they found no correlation. A third study in elite adolescent handball players found no association in females and no association in males when they were assessed in flexion, but there was an association when assessed in abduction. The last study by Kawasaki et al. in 2012 found that high level male rugby players were more likely to develop shoulder discomfort during the season if they had scapular dyskinesis preseason. Taking all of this information together, it's not very convincing that scapular dyskinesis is going to put you at risk for future injury. So before I get into my practical recommendations, I just wanna briefly discuss what traditional rehabilitation looks like that normally aims to correct scapular dyskinesis. McClure 2004, May 2012, and Schrift 2012 have demonstrated that individuals diagnosed with shoulder impingement who undergo rehabilitation improve in their pain and function despite no changes in how their scapula moves. And I know what you might be thinking. Well, the scapular kinematics probably didn't change because of the poor exercise selection or programming done by the researchers. Maybe, but does it really matter? Based on these studies, it seems that the scapular kinematics or that scapular humoral rhythm doesn't need to change for symptoms or function to improve. So if that's the case, should it really be the goal of rehab? Probably not. We've already identified that we do not have a good working definition of normal. Scapular dyskinesis is common in asymptomatic individuals and does not seem to predict future injury. And it might actually be an advantageous adaptation. And there's potential harm in overly focusing on changing the scapular humoral rhythm. People might become fearful or hypervigilant if their symptoms improve, but their shoulder looks the same. So for me, I'll still assess the shoulder, 
but I'm looking for big things that might require a consultation with a medical doctor for further investigative workup, like an injury to the brachial plexus or insult to the spinal accessory nerve, dorsal scapular nerve, long thoracic nerve, and it ties in with the mechanism of injury or their objective examination, so significant weakness, loss of range of motion, atrophy, etc. Even then, conservative management is often gonna be the first line of treatment. And I still think that exercise selection and dosage are incredibly important, but I just don't think that we should focus on changing the scapular motion. Instead, what matters to you? What are your goals and what's limiting you from reaching those goals? Is it pain, weakness, range of motion limitations, fear? Take that end goal, figure out your current capacity and slowly bridge that gap. I'll give you some examples. Do you have difficulty with pushing or pulling movements? Let's say you say pushing. Now, do you have difficulty with overhead pushing or horizontal? Let's say you say horizontal. Now I'm gonna ask, is it more so with weight bearing or non weight bearing? Let's assume you say weight bearing. So you have difficulty with weight bearing, horizontal pressing movements. Let's see how we can get you back to doing that. A big emphasis in traditional rehabilitation is the serratus anterior. But how can we train that muscle without hyper-focusing on it? Here's a sample progression. A tall plank plus, to an eccentric push-up, to a push-up plus, to a band-resisted push-up. So we're still training that serratus anterior, but we're also working the pecs, the deltoids, the triceps, the rotator cuff, and we're making the person really strong in this weight-bearing horizontal pressing movement. Another major emphasis in traditional rehabilitation is a lower trapezius. But same thing, how can we train this muscle without overly focusing on it and worrying about what the scapula is necessarily doing? So here's a sample non-weight bearing progression for overhead movement. We can have the person start with a prone A, work towards a prone T, then a prone Y, and then prone swimmers. So they're building strength throughout the entire range of motion. And yes, you are still hitting that lower trapezius. And yes, I understand that these aren't perfect examples that are gonna work for everybody. They're just sample progressions. For example, that push-up, we could go into a downward dog. We could go into a toe tap. We can go into a plank rotation so that you're also working weight bearing overhead, weight bearing on a single arm. And for athletes, right, if it's somebody who just needs to press, well, we can just do a vertical pressing progression and scale it as needed. Once again, these are just ideas, but it gives you an idea of finding your end goal, understanding your current capacity, and bridging that gap over time. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I know that I threw out a lot of references throughout and so if you want to check those out, I actually wrote a blog that's on our website. You can see all the references there and more because it goes into a little more depth. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, leave some comments below, and I'll get around to answering them. Peace.